Hello everyone, my name is Miss Sarah. Welcome to the Kakana Public Library's Virtual Book Club, where we are going to be reading Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte together. Um, if you have a copy of the book, you can read along at home. Otherwise, I will be reading it out loud to you as we go through. And today we're going to read the first three chapters. So, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter one. There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering, indeed, in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning, but since dinner, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early, the cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so somber and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight with nipped fingers and toes and a heart saddened by the ch chidings of Bessie, the nurse, and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Eliza, John, and Georgina Reed. The said Eliza, John, and Georgina were now clustered round their mamma in the drawing room. She lay reclined on a sofa by the fireside and with her darlings about her, for the time neither quarreling nor crying, looked perfectly happy. Me, she had dispensed from joining the group, saying she regretted to be under the necessity of keeping me at a distance, but that until she heard from Bessie and could discover by her own observation that I was endeavoring in good earnest to acquire a more sociable and childlike disposition, a more attractive and sprightly manner, something lighter, franker, and more natural as it were, she really must exclude me from the privileges intended only for contented, happy little children. What does Bessie say I have done? I asked. Jane, I don't like cavillers or questioners. Besides, there is something truly forbidding in a child taking up her elders in that manner. Be seated somewhere, and until you can speak pleasantly, remain silent. A small breakfast room adjoined the drawing room. I slipped in there. It contained a bookcase. I soon possessed myself of a volume, taking care that it should be one stored with pictures. I mounted into the window seat, gathering up my feet, I sat cross-legged like a Turk, and having drawn the red moreen curtain nearly closed, I was shrined in double retirement. Folds of scarlet drapery shut in my view to the right hand. To the left were the clear panes of glass, protecting but not separating me from the drear November day. At intervals, while turning over the leaves of my book, I studied the aspect of that winter afternoon. Afar, it offered a pale blank of mist and cloud, near a scene of wet lawn and storm-beat shrub with ceaseless rain sweeping away wildly before a long and lamentable blast. I returned to my book, Bewick's History of British Birds. The letterpress thereof I cared little for, generally speaking, and yet there were certain introductory pages that, child as I was, I could not pass quite as a blank. They were those which treat of the haunts of sea fowl, of the solitary rocks and promontories by them only inhabited, of the coast of Norway studded with isles from the southern extremity, the Lindisness or Naze to the North Cape, where the northern ocean and vast worlds boils round the naked melancholy isles of farthest Thule, and the Atlantic surge pours in among the stormy Hebrides. Nor could I pass unnoticed the suggestion of the bleak shores of Lapland, Siberia, Spitsbergen, Nova Zembla, Iceland, Greenland, with the vast sweep of the Arctic zone, and those forlorn regions of dreary space, that reservoir of frost and snow, where firm fields of ice, the accumulation of centuries of winters, glazed in alpine heights above heights, surrounded the pole, and concentered the multiplied rigors of extreme cold. Of these death-white realms, I formed an idea of my own, shadowy, like the like all the half-comprehended notions that float dim through children's brains, but strangely impressive. The words in these introductory pages connected themselves with the succeeding vignettes and gave significance to the rock standing up alone in the sea of billow and spray, to the broken boat stranded on desolate coast, to the cold and ghastly moon glancing through bars of cloud at a wreck just sinking. I cannot tell what sentiment haunted the quite solitary churchyard with its inscribed headstone, its gate, its two trees, its low horizon girdled by a broken wall, and its newly risen crescent attesting the hour of eventide. The two ships becalmed on a torpid sea, I believe to be marine phantoms. The fiend pinning down the thief's pack behind him I passed over quickly, 
It was an object of terror. So was the black horned thing seated aloof on a rock, surveying a distant crowd surrounding a gallows. Each picture told a story, mysterious often to my undeveloped understanding and imperfect feelings, yet ever profoundly interesting, as interesting as the tales Bessie sometimes narrated on winter evenings when she chanced to be in good humor, and when, having brought her ironing table to the nursery hearth, she allowed us to sit about it. And while she got up Mrs. Reed's lace frills and crimped her nightcap borders, fed our eager attention with passages of love and adventure taken from old fairy tales and other ballads, or, as at a later period I discovered, from the pages of Pamela and Henry, Earl of Moreland. With Bewick on my knee, I was then happy, happy at least in my way. I feared nothing but interruption, and that came too soon. The breakfast room door opened. Boh, Madame Mope, cried the voice of John Reed. Then he paused. He found the room apparently empty. Where the dickens is she? He continued. Lizzie, Georgie, calling to his sisters. Joan is not here at all. Tell Mama she's run out into the rain, bad animal. It is well I drew the curtain, thought I, and wished fervently he might not discover my hiding place, nor would John Reed have found it out himself. He was not quick, either of vision or conception. But Eliza just put her head in at the door, and she said at once, She's in the window seat, to be sure, Jack. And I came out immediately, for I trembled at the idea of being dragged forth by the said Jack. What do you want? I asked, with awkward diffidence. Say, what do you want, Master Reed? was the answer. I want you to come here. And seating himself in an armchair, he intimated by a gesture that I was to approach and stand before him. John Reed was a schoolboy of 14 years old, four years older than I, for I was but 10. Large and stout for his age, with a dingy and unwholesome skin, thick lineaments and a spacious visage, heavy limbs and large extremities, he gorged himself habitually at table, which made him bilious and gave him a dim and blearied eye and flabby cheeks. He ought now to have been at school, but his mamma had taken him home for a month or two on account of his delicate health. Mr. Miles, the master, affirmed that he would do very well if he had fewer cakes and sweetmeats sent to him from home, but the mother's heart turned from an opinion so harsh and inclined rather to the more refined idea that John's sallowness was owing to over-application and perhaps a pining after home. John had not much affection for his mother and sisters and an antipathy to me. He bullied and punished me, not two or three times in the week, nor once or twice in the day, but continually. Every nerve I had feared him and every morsel of flesh in my bones shrank when he came near. There were moments when I was bewildered by the terror he inspired, because I had no appeal whatever against either his menaces or his inflictions. The servants did not like to offend their young master by taking my part against him, and Mrs. Reed was blind and deaf to the subject. She never saw him strike or heard him abuse me, though he did both now and then in her very presence, more frequently, however, behind her back. Habitually obedient to John, I came up to his chair. He spent some three minutes in thrusting out his tongue at me as far as he could without damaging the roots. I knew he would soon strike, and while dreading the blow, I mused on the disgusting and ugly appearance of him who would presently deal it. I wonder if he read that notion in my face, for all at once without speaking, he struck suddenly and strongly. I tottered, and on regaining my equilibrium, retired back a step or two from the chair. That is for your impudence in answering Mama a while since, said he and for your sneaking way of getting behind curtains, and for the look you had in your eyes two minutes since, you rat. Accustomed to John Reed's abuse, I never had an idea of replying to it. My care was how to endure the blow, which would certainly follow the insult. What were you doing behind the curtain? he asked. I was reading. Show the book. I returned to the window and fetched it thence. You have no business to take our books. You are a dependent, Mama says. You have no money. Your father left you none. You ought to beg and not to live here with gentlemen's children like us and eat the same meals we do and wear clothes at our mamma's expense. Now I'll teach you to rummage in my bookshelves, for they are mine. All the house belongs to me, or will do in a few years. Go and stand by the door out of the way and out of the, out of the way of the mirror in the windows. I did so, not first aware what, his what were his intentions, but when I saw him lift and poise the book and stand and act to hurl it, I instinctively started aside with a cry of alarm. Not soon enough, however. The volume was flung, it hit me, and I fell, striking my head against the door and cutting it. 
The cut bled. The pain was sharp. My terror had passed its climax. Other feelings succeeded. Wicked and cruel boy, I said. You are like a murderer. You are like a slave driver. You are like the Roman emperors. I had read Goldsmith's History of Rome and had formed my opinions of Nero, Caligula, etc. Also, I had drawn parallels in silence, which I never thought thus to have declared aloud. What? What? he cried. Did she say that to me? Did you hear her, Eliza and Georgina? Won't I tell Mama? But first... He ran headlong at me. I felt him grasp my hair and my shoulder. He had closed with a desperate thing. I really saw him in a, as a tyrant. I saw in him a tyrant, a murderer. I felt a drop or two of blood from my head trickle down my neck and was sensible of somewhat pungent suffering. Those sensations for the time predominated over fear and I received him in frantic sort. I don't really well know what I did with my hands, but he called me rat, rat and bellowed out loud. Aid was near him. Eliza and Georgina had run for Mrs. Reed, who was gone upstairs. She now came upon the scene, followed by Bessie and her maid Abbott. We were parted. I heard the words, Dear, dear, what a fury to fly at Master John. Did anybody ever see such a picture of passion? Then Mrs. Reed subjoined, Take her away to the red room and lock her in there. Four hands were immediately laid upon me, and I was borne upstairs. Chapter 2 I resisted all the way, a new thing for me, and a circumstance which greatly strengthened the bad opinion Bessie and Miss Abbott were disposed to entertain of me. The fact is, I was a trifle beside myself, or rather out of myself, as the French would say. I was conscious that a moment's mutiny had already rendered me liable to strange penalties, and like any other rebel slave, I felt resolved in my desperation to go all lengths. Hold her arms, Miss Abbott, she's like a mad cat. For shame, for shame, cried the lady's maid. What shocking conduct, Miss Eyre, to strike a young gentleman, your benefactress's son, your young master. Master, how is he my master? Am I a servant? No, you are less than a servant, for you do nothing to earn your keep. There, sit down and think over your wickedness. They had got me by this time into the apartment indicated by Mrs. Reed and had thrust me upon a stool. My impulse was to rise from it like a spring. Their two pairs of hands arrested me instantly. If you don't sit still, you must be tied down, said Bessie. Miss Abbott, lend me your garters. She would break mine directly. Miss Abbott turned to divest a stout leg of the necessary ligature. This preparation for bonds and the additional ignominy it inferred took a little of the excitement out of me. Don't take them off, I cried. I will not stir. In guarantee whereof I attached myself to the seat by my hands. Mind you don't, said Bessie, and when she had ascertained that I was really subsiding, she loosened her hold of me. Then she and Miss Abbott stood with folded arms, looking darkly and doubtfully on my face, as incredulous of my sanity. She never did so before, at last said Bessie, turning to the Ab Abigail. But it was always in her, was the reply. I've told Mrs. often my opinion about the child, and Mrs. agreed with me. She's an underhand little thing. I never saw a girl of her age with so much cover. Bessie answered not, but ere long addressing me, she said, You ought to be aware, miss, that you are under obligations to Mrs. Reed. She keeps you. If she were to turn you off, you would have to go to the poorhouse. I had nothing to say to these words. They were not new to me. My very first recollection of existence included hints of the same kind. This reproach of my dependence had become a vague sing-song in my ear, very painful and crushing, but only half intelligible. Miss Abbott joined in. And you ought not to think of yourself on an equality with the Mrs. Reed and Master Reed, because Mrs. kindly allows you to be brought up with them. They will have a great deal of money, and you will have none. It is your place to be humble and try and make yourself agreeable to them. What we tell you is for your good, added Bessie in no harsh voice. You should try to be useful and pleasant. Then perhaps you would always have a home here. But if you become passionate and rude, Mrs. will send you away, I'm sure. Besides, said Miss Abbott, God will punish her. He might strike her dead in the midst of her tantrums, and then where would she go? Come, Bessie, we will leave her. I wouldn't have her heart for anything. Say your prayers, Miss Eyre, when you are by yourself, for if you don't repent, something bad might be permitted to come down the chimney and fetch you away. They went, shutting the door and locking it behind them. The red room was a spare chamber, very seldom slept in. I might say never, indeed, 
unless when a chance influx of visitors at Gateshead Hall rendered it necessary to turn to account all the accommodation it contained. Yet it was one of the largest and stateliest chambers in the mansion. A bed supported on massive pillars of mahogany hung with curtains of deep red damask stood out like a tabernacle in the center. The two large windows with their blinds always drawn down were half shrouded in festoons and folds of similar drapery. The carpet was red. The table at the foot of the bed was covered with a crimson cloth. The walls were soft fawn color with a blush of pink in it. The wardrobe, the toilet table, the chairs were of darkly polished old mahogany. Out of these deep surroundings, shades rose high and glared white and piled up mattresses and pillows of the bed spread with a snowy Marseille counterpane. Scarcely less prominent was an ample cushioned easy chair near the head of the bed, also white with a footstool before it and looking, as I thought, like a pale throne. This room was chill because it seldom had a fire. It was silent because remote from the nursery and kitchens, solemn because it was known to be so seldom entered. The housemaid alone came here on Saturdays to wipe from the mirrors and furniture a week's quiet dust, and Mrs. Reed herself, at far intervals, visited to review the contents of a certain secret drawer in the wardrobe where were stored diverse parchments, her jewel casket, and a miniature of her deceased husband. And in those last words lies the secret of the Red Room, the spell which kept it so lonely in spite of its grandeur. Mr. Reed had been dead nine years. It was in this chamber he breathed his last, here he lay in state, hence his coffin was borne by the undertaker's men, and since that day a sense of dreary consecration had, get, had guarded it from frequent intrusion. My seat, to which Bessie and the bitter Miss Abbott had left me riveted, was a low ottoman near the marble chimney piece. The bed rose before me to my right. To my right hand there was the high, dark wardrobe with the subdued broken reflections varying the gloss of its panels. To my left were the marbled windows, a great looking glass between them repeated the vacant majesty of the bed and room. I was not quite sure whether they had locked the door, and when I dared move, I got up and went to see. Alas, yes, no jail was ever more secure. Returning, I had to cross before the looking glass. My fascinated glance involuntarily explored the depth it revealed. All looked colder and darker in that visionary hollow than in reality and the strange little figure there gazing at me with a white face and arms specking in the gloom. Glittering eyes of fear, moving where all else was still, had the effect of a real spirit. I thought it like one of the tiny phantoms, half fairy, half imp, Bessie's evening stories represented, as coming out of the lone, ferny dells and moors and appearing before the eyes of belated travelers. I returned to my stool. Superstition was with me at that moment, but it was not yet her hour for complete victory. My blood was still warm. The mood of the revolted slave was still bracing me with its bitter vigor. I had to stem a rapid rush of retrospective thought before I quailed to the dismal present. All John Reed's violent tyrannies, all his sister's proud indifference, all his mother's aversion, all the servant's partiality turned up in my disturbed mind like a dark deposit in a turbid well. Why was I always suffering, always browbeaten, always accused, forever condemned? Why could I never please? Why was it useless to try to win anyone's favor? Eliza, who was headstrong and selfish, was respected. Georgina, who had a spoiled temper, a very acrid spite, a captious and insolent carriage, was universally indulged. Her beauty, her pink cheeks and golden curls seemed to give delight to all who looked at her and to purchase indemnity for every fault. John, no one thwarted, much less punished, though he twisted the necks of pigeons and killed the little pea chicks, set the dogs at the sheep, stripped the hothouse vines of their fruit, and broke the buds of the choicest plants in the conservatory. He called his mother old girl, too, sometimes reviled her for her dark skin, similar to his own, bluntly disregarded her wishes, not unfrequently tore and spoiled her silk attire, and he was still her own darling. I dared commit no fault, I strove to fulfill every duty, and I was termed naughty and tiresome, sullen and sneaking, from morning to noon and from noon to night. My head still ached and bled from the blow and the fall I had received. No one had reproved John for wantonly striking me, and because I had turned against him to avert further irrational violence, I was loaded with general opprobrium. Unjust, unjust, said my reason, 
forced by the agonizing stimulus into precocious though transitory power and resolve equally wrought up instigated some strange expedient to achieve escape from insupportable oppression as running away or if that could not be affected never eating or drinking more and letting myself die what a consternation of soul was mine that dreary afternoon how all my brain was in tumult and all my heart in insurrection Yet in what darkness, what dense ignorance was the mental battle fought? I could not answer the ceaseless inward question, why I thus suffered. Now at the distance of, I will not say how many years, I see it clearly. I was a discord in Gateshead Hall. I was like nobody there. I had nothing in harmony with Mrs. Reed or her children or her chosen vassalage. They did not love me, in fact, as, as little as I, they did not love me, in fact, as little as I did love them. They were not bound to regard with affection a thing that could not sympathize with one amongst them, a heterogeneous thing, opposed to them in temperament, in capacity, in propensities, a useless thing, incapable of serving their interests or adding to the pleasure, a noxious thing, cherishing the germs of indignation in their treatment, of contempt of their judgment. I know that I had been, a, had I been a sanguine, brilliant, careless, exacting, handsome, romping child, though equally dependent and friendless, Mrs. Reed would have endured my presence more complacently. Her children would have entertained for me more of the cordiality of fellow feeling. The servants would have been less prone to make me the scapegoat of the nursery. Daylight began to forsake the Red Room. It was just past four o'clock and the beclouded afternoon was tending to drear twilight. I heard the rain still beating continuously on the staircase window and the wind howling in the grove behind the hall. I grew by degrees cold as a stone, and then my courage sank. My habitual mood of humiliation, self-doubt, forlorn depression fell damp on the embers of my decaying ire. All said I was wicked, and perhaps I might be so. What thought had I been just conceiving of starving myself to death? That certainly was a crime. And was I fit to die? Or was the vault under the chancel of Gateshead Church an inviting born? In such vault I had been told did Mr. Reed lie buried, and led by this thought to recall his idea, I dwelt on it with a gathering dread. I could not remember him, but I knew that he was my own uncle, my mother's brother, and that he had taken me when apparent, as a, when apparently infant to his house, and that in his last moments he had required a promise of Mrs. Reed, that she would rear and maintain me as one of her own children. Mrs. Reed probably considered she had kept this promise, and so she had, I dare say, as well as her nature would permit her. But how could she really like an interloper, not of her race, and unconnected with her after her husband's death by any tie? It must have been most irksome to find herself bound by a hard-wrung pledge to stand in the stead of a parent to a strange child she could not love, and to see an uncongenial alien permanently intruded upon her family group. A singular notion dawned upon me, I doubted not, had never doubted, that if Mr. Reed had been alive, he would have treated me kindly. And now, as I sat looking at the white bed and overshadowed walls, occasionally also turning a fascinated eye toward the dimly gleaming mirror, I began to recall what I had heard of dead men, troubled in their graves by the violation of their last wishes, revisiting the earth to punish the perjured and avenge the oppressed. And I thought Mr. Reed's spirit, harassed by the wrongs of his sister's child, might quit its abode, whether in the church vault or in the unknown world of the departed, and rise before me in this chamber. I wiped my tears and hushed my sobs, fearful lest any sign of violent grief might awaken a preternatural voice to comfort me, or elicit from the gloom some haloed face bending over me with strange pity. This idea, consolatory in theory, I felt would be terrible if realized. With all my might, I endeavored to stifle it. I endeavored to be firm. Shaking my hair from my eyes, I lifted my head and tried to look boldly around the dark room. At this moment, a light gleamed on the wall. Was it, I asked myself, a ray from the moon penetrating some aperture in the blind? No, moonlight was still a mist stirred. While I gazed at it, glided up to the ceiling and quivered over my head. I can now conjecture readily that this streak of light was, in all likelihood, a gleam from a lantern carried by someone across the lawn. But then, prepared as my mind was for horror, shaken as my nerves were by agitation, I thought the swift darting beam was a herald of some coming vision from another world. My heart beat thick, my head grew hot, 
A sound filled my ears, which I deemed to be the rushing of wings. Something seemed near me. I was oppressed, suffocated, endurance broke down. I uttered a wild, involuntary cry. I rushed to the door and shook the lock in desperate effort. Steps came running along the outer passage. The key turned. Bessie and Abbott entered. "'Miss Eyre, are you ill?' said Bessie. "'What a dreadful noise! It went right through me!' exclaimed Abbott. "'Take me out! Let me go to the nursery!' was my cry. "'What for? Are you hurt? Have you seen something?' again demanded Bessie. "'Oh, I saw a light! I thought a ghost would come!' I had now got hold of Bessie's hand, and she did not snatch it from me. "'She's screamed out on purpose,' declared Abbott in some disgust. "'And what a scream! If she had been in great pain, one would have excused it, "'but she only wanted to bring us all here. I know her naughty tricks.' "'What is all this?' demanded another voice, preemptorily, "'and Mrs. Reed came along the corridor, her cap flying wide, her gown rustling stormily. "'Abbott and Bessie, I believe I gave orders that Jane Eyre should be left in the Red Room till I came to her myself. "'Miss Jane screamed so loud, ma'am,' pleaded Bessie. "'Let her go,' was the only answer. "'Loose Bessie's hand, child. You cannot succeed in getting out by these means, be assured.' I abhor artifice, particularly in children. It is my duty to show you that tricks will not answer. You will now stay here an hour longer, and it is only on condition of perfect submission and stillness that I shall liberate you then. Oh, aunt, have pity. Forgive me, I cannot endure it. Let me be punished some other way. I shall be killed if silence. This violence is all more repulsive, and so no doubt she felt it. I was a precocious actress in her eyes. She sincerely looked on me as a compound of virulent passions, mean spirit, and dangerous duplicity. Bessie and Abbott having retreated, Mrs. Reed, impatient of my now frantic anguish and wild sobs, abruptly thrust me back and locked me in, without further parley. I heard her sweeping away, and soon after she was gone. I suppose I had a species of fit. Unconsciousness closed the scene. Chapter three. The next thing I remember is waking up with a feeling as if I had a frightful nightmare and seeing before me a terrible red glare crossed with thick black bars. I heard voices too, speaking with a hollow sound as if muffled by a rush of wind or water. Agitation, uncertainty, an all predominating sense of terror confused my faculties. Ere long I became aware that someone was handling me, lifting me up and supporting me in a sitting posture, and that more tenderly than I had ever been raised or upheld before. I rested my head against a pillow or an arm and felt easy. In five minutes more, a cloud of bewilderment dissolved. I knew quite well that I was in my own bed and that the red glare was the nursery fire. It was night, a candle burnt on the table. Bessie stood at the bed foot with a basin in her hand, and a gentleman sat in a chair near my pillow, leaning over me. I felt an inexpressible relief, a soothing conviction of protection and security, when I knew that there was a stranger in the room, an individual not belonging to Gateshead and not related to Mrs. Reed. Turning from Bessie, though her presence was far less obnoxious to me than that of Abbott, for instance, would have been, I scrutinized the face of the gentleman. I knew him. It was Mr. Lloyd, an apothecary, sometimes called in by Mrs. Reed when the servants were ailing. For herself and the children, she employed a physician. Well, who am I? he asked. I pronounced his name, offering him at the same time my hand. He took it, smiling and saying, we shall do very well by and by. Then he laid me down and addressing Bessie, charged her to be very careful that I was not disturbed during the night. Having given some further directions and intimated that he should call again the next day, he departed. To my grief, I felt so sheltered and befriended while he sat in the chair near my pillow, and as he closed the door after him, all the room darkened and my heart again sank. Inexpressible sadness weighed it down. "'Do you feel as if you should sleep, miss?' asked Bessie, rather softly. Scarcely I dared answer her, for I feared the next sentence might be rough. "'I will try.' Would you like to drink or could you eat anything? No, thank you, Bessie. Then I think I shall go to bed for it is past 12 o'clock, but you may call me if you want anything in the night. Wonderful civility this, it emboldened me to ask the question, Bessie, what's the matter with me? Am I ill? You fell sick, I suppose, in the red room with crying. You'll be better soon, no doubt. Bessie went into the housemaid's apartment, which was near. I heard her say, 
Sarah, come sleep with me in the nursery. I daren't for my life be alone with that poor child tonight. She might die. It's such a strange thing she should have that fit. I wonder if she saw anything. Mrs. was rather too hard. Sarah came back with her. They both went to bed. They were whispering together for half an hour before they fell asleep. I caught scraps of their conversation from which I was able only too distinctly to infer their main subject discussed. Something passed her all dressed in white and vanished. A great black dog behind him. Three loud raps on the chamber door. A light in the churchyard just over his grave, etc., etc. At last both slept. The fire and the candle went out. For me, the watches of that long night passed in ghastly wakefulness. Ear, eye, and mind were alike strained by dread, such dread as children only can feel. No severe or prolonged bodily illness followed this incident of the Red Room. It only gave my nerves a shock, of which I feel the reverberation to this day. Yes, Mrs. Reed, to you I owe some fearful pangs of mental suffering, but I ought to forgive you, for you knew not what you did. While rending my heartstrings, you thought you were only uprooting my bad propensities. Next day by noon, I was up and dressed and sat wrapped in a shawl by the nursery hearth. I felt physically weak and broken down, but my worst ailment was an unutterable wretchedness of mind, a wretchedness which kept drawing from me silent tears. No sooner had I wiped the salt drop from my cheek than another followed. Yet I thought I ought to have been happy, for none of the reeds were there. They were all gone out in the carriage with their mamma. Abbott, too, was sewing in another room, and Bessie, as she moved hither and thither, putting away toys and arranging drawers, addressed to me every now and then a word of unwanted kindness. This state of things should have, been, should have been to me a paradise of peace, accustomed as I was to a life of ceaseless reprimand and thankless drudgery. But in fact, my racked nerves were now in such a state that no calm could soothe and no pleasure excite them agreeably. Bessie had been down into the kitchen, and she brought up with her a tart on a certain brightly painted china plate, whose birds of paradise nestling in a wreath of convivoli and rosebuds had been wont to stir me in a most enthusiastic sense of admiration, and which plate I had often petitioned to be allowed to take in my hand in order to examine it more closely, but had always hitherto been deemed unworthy of such a privilege. This precious vessel was now placed on my knee, and I was cordially invited to eat the circlet of delicate pastry upon it. Vain favor, coming like most other favors and long deferred and often wished for, too late. I could not eat the tart, and the plumage of the bird, the tints of the flowers, seemed strangely faded. I put both plate and tart away. Bessie asked if I would have a book. The word book acted as a transient stimulus, and I begged her to fetch Gulliver's Travels from the library. This book I had again and again perused with delight. I considered it a narrative of facts, and discovered it in vain of interest deeper than what I found in fairy tales, for as to the elves, having sought them in vain among foxglove leaves and bells, under mushrooms, and beneath the ground, ground ivy mantling old walnuts, I had at length made up my mind to the sad truth that they were all gone out of England to some savage country, where the woods were wilder and thicker, and the population more scant. Whereas Lilliput and Brobdingnag being, in my creed, solid parts of the earth's surface, I doubted not that I might one day, by taking a long voyage, see with my own eyes the little fields, houses, and trees, the diminutive people, the tiny cows, sheep, and birds of the one realm, and the cornfields, forests high, of the mighty mastiffs and monster cats, the tower-like men and women of the other. Yet when this cherished volume was now placed in my hand, when I turned over its leaves and sought in its marvelous pictures the charm I had until now never failed to find, all was eerie and dreary. The giants were gaunt goblins, the pygmies malevolent and fearful imps, Gulliver, Gulliver a most desolate wanderer, in most dread and dangerous regions. I closed the book, which I dared no longer peruse, and put it on the table beside the untasted tart. Bessie had now finished dusting and tidying the room, and having washed her hands, she opened a curtain a certain little drawer full of splendid shreds of silk and satin and began making a new bonnet for Georgina's doll. Meantime, she sang. Her song was in the days when we were gypsying a long time ago. I had often heard the song before and always with lively delight for Bessie had a sweet voice. At least I thought so. But now, though her voice was still sweet, I found, it, I found in its melancholy an indescribable sadness. Sometimes preoccupied with her work, 
She sang the refrain very low, very lingeringly. A long time ago came out like the saddest cadence of a funeral hymn. She passed into another ballad, this time a really doleful one. My feet they are sore, and my limbs they are weary. Long is the way, and the mountains are wild. Soon will the twilight close moreless and dreary over the path of the poor orphan child. Why did they send me so far and so lonely, up where the moors spread and the gray rocks are piled? Men are hard-hearted, and kind angels only watch over the steps of the poor orphan child. Yet distant and soft the night breeze is blowing, clouds there are none, and clear stars beam mild. God in his mercy protection is showing, comfort and hope to the poor orphan child. Even should I fall o'er the broken bridge passing, or stray in the marshes by false lights beguiled, still with my father with promise and blessing take to his bosom the poor orphan child. There was thought for the strength should avail me, though both of shelter and kindred despoiled. Heaven is a home and rest will not fail me. God is a friend to the poor orphan child. Come, Miss Jane, don't cry, said Bessie as she finished. She might as well have said to the fire, don't burn. But how could she divine the morbid suffering to which I was prey? In the course of the morning, Mr. Lloyd came again. What, already up? said he as he entered the nursery. Well, nurse, how is she? Bessie answered that I was doing very well. Then she ought to look more cheerful. Come here, Miss Jane. Your name is Jane, is it not? Yes, sir, Jane Eyre. Well, you have been crying, Miss Jane Eyre. Can you tell me what about? Have you any pain? No, sir. Oh, I dare say she's crying because she could not go out with the missus in the carriage, interposed Bessie. Surely not. Why, she is too old for such pettiness. I thought so, too, and my self-esteem being wounded by the false charge, I answered promptly, I never cried for such a thing in my life. I hate going out in the carriage. I cry because I'm miserable. Oh, fine, miss, said Bessie. The good apothecary appeared a little puzzled. I was standing before him. He fixed his eyes on me very steadily. His eyes were small and gray, not very bright, but I dare say I should think him shrewd now. He had a hard-featured yet good-natured looking face. Having considered me at leisure, he said, What made you ill yesterday? She had a fall, said Bessie, again putting in her word. Fall? Why, that is like a baby again. Can't she manage to walk at her age? She must be eight or nine years old. I was knocked down, was the blunt expression, jerked out of me by another pang of mortified pride. But that did not make me ill, I added, while Mr. Lloyd helped himself to a pinch of snuff. As he was returning the box to his waistcoat pocket, a loud bell rang for the servant's dinner. He knew what it was. That's for you, nurse, said he. You can go down. I'll give Miss Jane a lecture till you come back. Bessie would rather have stayed, but she was obliged to go, because punctuality at meals was rigidly enforced at Gateshead Hall. The fall did not make you ill? What did then? pursued Mr. Lloyd when Bessie was gone. I was shut up in a room where there was a ghost till after dark. I saw Mr. Lloyd smile and frown at the same time. Ghost? What you are a baby after all. You're afraid of ghosts? Of Mr. Reed's ghost I am. He died in that room and he was laid out there. Neither Bessie nor anyone else will go in there at night if they can help it. And it was cruel to shut me up alone without a candle. So cruel that I think I shall never forget it. Nonsense. And is it that that makes you so miserable? Are you afraid now in daylight? No, but the night will come again before long. And besides, I'm unhappy, very unhappy for other things. What other things? Can you tell me some of them? How much I wish to reply fully to this question. How difficult it was to frame my answer. Children can feel, but they cannot analyze their feelings. And if the analysis is partially affected in thought, they know not how to express the result of the process in words. Fearful, however, of losing this first and only opportunity of relieving my grief by imparting it, I, after a disturbed pause, contrived to frame a meager, though as far as it went, true response. For one thing, I have no mother or father, brothers or sisters. You have a kind aunt and cousins. Again, I paused and then begrudgingly announced. But John Reed knocked me down, and my aunt shut me up in the red room. Mr. Lloyd, a second time, produced his snuff box. Don't you think Gateshead Hall a very beautiful house? asked he. Are you not very thankful to have such a fine place to live at? It is not my house, sir, and Abbott says I have less right to be here than a servant. Pooh, you can't be silly enough to wish to leave such a splendid place. If I had anywhere else to go, I should be glad to leave it, but I can never get away from Gateshead till I am a woman. 
Perhaps you may. Who knows? Have you any relations beside Mrs. Reed? I think not, sir. None belonging to your father? I don't know. I asked Aunt Reed once, but she said possibly I might have some poor low relations called heir, but she knew nothing about them. If you had such, would you like to go to them? I reflected. Poverty looks grim to grown people, still more so to children. They have not much idea of industrious, working, respectable poverty. They think of the word only as connected with ragged clothes, scanty food, fireless grates, rude manners, and debasing vices. Poverty for me was synonymous with degradation. No, I should not like to belong to poor people, was my reply. Not even if they were kind to you. I shook my head. I could not see how poor people had the means of being kind. And then to learn to speak like them, to adopt their manners, to be uneducated, to grow up like one of the poor women I saw sometimes nursing their children or washing their clothes at the cottage doors at the village of Gateshead. No, I was not heroic enough to purchase liberty at the price of taste. But are your relatives so very poor? Are they working people? I cannot tell. Aunt Reed says if I have any, they must be beggarly set. I should not like to go a-begging. Would you like to go to school? Again, I reflected. I scarcely knew what school was. Bessie sometimes spoke of it as a place where young ladies sat in the stocks, wore backboards, and were expected to be exceedingly genteel and precise. John Reed hated his school and abused his master, but John Reed's tastes were no rule for mine, and if Bessie's accounts of school discipline, gathered from the young ladies of a family where she had lived before coming to Gateshead, were somewhat appalling, her details of certain accomplishments attained by these same young ladies were, I thought, equally attractive. She boasted of beautiful paintings of landscapes and flowers by them executed, of songs they could sing and pieces they could play, of purses they could net, of French books they could translate, till my spirit was moved to emulation as I listened. Besides, school would be a complete change. It implied a long journey, an entire separation from Gateshead, an entrance into a new life. I should indeed like to go to school, was the audible conclusion of my musings. Well, well, who knows what may happen, said Mr. Lloyd as he got up. The child ought to have a change of air and scene, he added, speaking to himself. Nerves not in a good state. Bessie now returned at the same moment the carriage was heard rolling up the gravel walk. Is that your mistress, nurse? asked Mr. Lloyd. I should like to speak to her before I go. Bessie invited him to walk into the breakfast room and led the way out. In the interview which followed between him and Mrs. Reed, I presume, from after occurrences, that the apothecary ventured to recommend my being sent to school, and the recommendation was no doubt readily enough adopted, for as Abbott said in discussing the subject with Bessie when both sat sewing in the nursery one night after I was in bed and, they thought, asleep. Mrs. was, she dared say, glad enough to get rid of such a tiresome, ill-conditioned child who always looked as if she were watching everybody and scheming plots underhand. Abbott, I think, gave me credit for being a sort of infantine Guy Fox. On that same occasion, I learned for the first time from Miss Abbott's communications to Bessie that my father had been a poor clergyman and that my mother had married him against the wishes of her friends who considered the match beneath her, that my grandfather Reed was so irritated at her disobedience he cut her off without a shilling, that after my mother and father had been married a year, the latter caught the typhus fever while visiting among the poor of a large manufacturing town where his curacy was situated, and where that disease was then prevalent, that my mother took the infection from him and both died within a month of each other. Bessie, when she heard this narrative, sighed and said, Poor Miss Jane is to be pitied too, Abbott. Yes, responded Abbott. If she were a nice, pretty child, one, one might compassionate her forlornness, but one really cannot care for such a little toad as that. Not a great deal, to be sure, agreed Bessie. At any rate, a beauty like Miss Georgina would be more moving in the same condition. Yes, I dote on Miss Georgina, cried the fervent abbot. Little darling, with her long curls and blue eyes, and such a sweet color she has, just as if she were painted. Bessie, I should fancy a Welsh rabbit for supper. So could I, with a roast onion. Come, we'll go down. They went. And that is the end of chapter three. We will read the next two chapters next time, and if you would like to discuss the content of what we've just read in the comments, I will be there to chat with you. Thanks so much for joining us for our virtual book club.